Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for selecting this presentation. So we will talk about the real case of offline first app, farmer app in Ghana. So before we start, let me introduce myself and my partner here. My name is Arif. I am Android engineer in Degas. And this is Takuya Kodama, Android engineer and also tech lead at Degas. And quick introduction about Degas. Degas is a Japanese tech startup focused on agriculture in Ghana. So our business is mainly focused on Ghana. What we are doing is we are financing farmer, assessing their fields, and also provide them with training to increase their productivity and also their income. And this is what we are going to cover in this presentation. We slightly changed our description from the original plan, but overall we still cover most of it, like red strategy, right strategy, and the real case challenges that we faced so far. Before we talk about our offline first step implementation, let me introduce about Ghana and Ghana farmer community first. So Ghana is a country in Africa located there. The population is around 35 million people and their area is almost one third of Japan and 52% of people are working in agriculture. And in average, the farmer income is $3.2 per day and the internet speed is 12 megabit per second. And in Ghana, the farmers are grouped by community like this. As you can see in the photo, it's our agent are sharing knowledge to the farmer. And this community place mostly don't have internet access. So that is about Ghana, and this is the condition that we faced when we have to build an application there. So let's move on to offline first app. Offline first app definition by Android documentation is an app that can do these three things. First, remain usable without a reliable network connection. Second, present users with local data immediately instead of waiting for the first network call to complete or fail. And the last one is fetch data in a manner that is conscious of battery and data status. So before we move on to how we implement our offline first app, we'd like to explain what our app is, what is it for, how it works, and who is it for. So first of all, our app is not used by farmer directly because not every farmer has a phone. So we have agents as a middleman between farmer and our systems in our app. So when farmer does something, they will tell agent and agent will make a record in our app. Or when agent asking farmer to do something, then they will record it in our app. So basically agent is our user. And there is no relation between each agent, so lucky for us, we don't need to sync between each other agent's data. And our use case, for example, is recovery. It's a recovery a harvested crop. When it's time to harvesting some crops, the agent will record the data, like what kind of crop it is, and number of bags, etc., etc. So that is how our, web, our app works in general. And next, let's move on to the implementation. But first, let me explain about main operations, which is read and write strategy in offline mode. First is read. By Android definition, read is retrieving data for use by other parts of the app, like displaying information to the user. And write is persisting user input for later retrieval. So basically, it's pretty straightforward that read is how we process the data to show to user, and writes is how we process to a user input. And we can achieve this by having repositories in data layer. So the repository are responsible for combining data sources, and at least one of data sources should not need network access to perform its tasks. Because at a minimum, an offline first app should be able to perform reads without network access. And we're going to explain more detail about our strategies. First is read strategy, how we design our read strategy to be so-called offline first app. First is opening the app. So this is the UI of our app at home screen. And our app still needs to log in. So let's just assume 
we just logged in to our app. When opening the app, let's say we are landed to this recovery page. The first point when designing an offline first app is offline first app should never block user when the device is offline. And you can see some data there on the screen. So in order to show the data like this, we need to get the data directly from local resources. That is point number two, and that is the repository's job to do that. And our strategies in rich data is while we are providing user with local data, in the same time we also try to fetch the data in background from server and save it to our local database. And that also the repository's job to do. So basically, this is the three key points of our read strategies. And let's see the code. So let's say we have recovery view model here. And let's say we got the recoveries from our use case and call it in init. Here, if you are notice, we are using collect because our first read is going to be from local resources. But in the same time, we are fetching data from server. So by using collect here, we are able to update the UI once there's an update from API. And this is the use case. In the use case, there is a should fetch variable there. And you can make your logic to decide if you should fetch the data. The logic can be by time, by data, or anything else, depends on the requirement. Then if should fetch is true, use case will call repository to fetch it. But in the end, we just return the data from repository without even waiting for the fetch result. And then let's see our repository. First, let's take a look on our get function, which is get recoveries. This function is just directly get the data from DAO, which means we can just return the data. And here, our get functions return flow. So it allows us to update the subscribers when it has updates from API. So basically here, we are just get from DAO, map it to our model class, and then return it as a flow. And then the second one is fetch recoveries. So in the use case, we fetch recoveries and map it to our entity. But once the fetch result is coming, we just need to save it through our DAO. And our DAO will update our local data source and then it will push the data to use case and goes to view model and then the UI will get updated. So by doing this, we don't need to wait for the network fetch results and can present the user our local data immediately. And this is also mentioned in Android documents that any updates should be written to the local data source first and then the local data sources will update its consumer since it is observable. So in this repository, as you can see, there are two data sources there, one from network, which means API, and the other one is DAO. DAO is a data access object. It is a class where we define our database interactions, and it has a query methods inside, and we are using room database, and most of the return type is return as a flow. Yeah, so that is our read strategy. So here is our read strategy in a picture. We start from opening the app, and we get data from DAO and publish it to subscribers, and it will show us in the UI. And in the meantime, we also fetch the data, if we should fetch it, and once it's success, we save it, we save it through our DAO, and our DAO will update our local data source and then push the data to subscribers again, and it will show us in the UI as well. So that is how we basically implement our read strategy. So the next one is how we write the data. In offline first apps, there are three strategies to consider based on your app requirements. Those three are online only writes, queued writes, and lazy writes. But I'm not going to talk detail about these three, so let's just see the code. Let's say we have this model to input the recovered data type. We have data class recovery with farmer ID as long data type and etc. And our write strategy is very similar to lazy writes. By Android definition, lazy write is writing to local data source first, then queue the write to notify network at the earliest convenience. So because the data is critical to our app, we need to store it locally to avoid the risk of data loss. 
Again, you can check on this link for more detail. So, because we are using lazy write strategy and we save it as a draft, we decided to name it with draft as a prefix. So here, our recovery data class become re draft recovery. And then let's move on. Let's see our recovery repository again. So we just have to add one more function to write it. Here we have save draft recovery to just save the data to our local database. But we decided to make another DAO for draft only. So here you can see there's another DAO for draft DAO called draft recovery DAO. And we called it in our save functions here. And the difference between DAO and draft DAO is DAO is to store the actual data that has been sent to server or returned by server, while draft DAO is to store temporary data before send it to server. We decided to make it different DAO because the actual data will have ID from server, but our draft is just having auto-generate ID from room. For avoid the conflicts, we decided to make it different DAO. So now our input data has been successfully in our local resources. The next one is post to server or API. Here is a confirmation screen before we store data to local and to server. After press submit, we store the data to our local and also we call our work manager in the view model. This is our work manager for recovery. I don't show in this screen, but we just use NQ unique work, like Android recommendation, but one thing I want to mention is about do work function here. In our do work function, we are calling repository to post the draft data from our previous input, and also some data that has not been sent to server, and we are sending a notification whether it is successful or not to let the user know. And then as you can see here in the post recovery, first we are getting drafts from draft DAO, then calling api.postdrafts to post all the draft data. And if it succeeds, API will respond with data that we just sent to server, but this time we have ID from server. And then we just need to save the data through our DAO. So this is how we are managed to posting or sending data to server. So yeah, that's basically it for sending data to server. And then let's take a look at our home screen again. In this home screen, previously we just get data only from DAO, which means sync data from server. And let's say after a user input something, their device still offline. So the data they input has not sent to server yet, and it's still in our draft DAO. So we should also show it to them, so they won't get confused whether it has been successfully input or not. Otherwise, they will try to make the same input again. So to tackle this, we need to get data from draft as well. So this is our previous get function. We just get data from DAO. That's why our draft is not showing to user yet. So all we need to do is to combine draft data with sync data like this. So we just modified our get function to something like this to combine DAO and draft DAO's data. And by doing this, now we can show the draft data to the user as well. And we can combine the draft data with sync data because for our model, we are creating an interface like this. We are creating a sealed interface for draft and synced. We name it synced because it was data from server. So by doing this, we can just combine the data easily to show it to the user. So now let's say the screen has a combination data of synced and draft data. Now we have to make sure that the data is not duplicate because we have two DAO and after the draft sync, it will save it to DAO, which means we have the same data across two DAOs. So to tackle this issue, we decided to add is synced parameter. See the last variable there, but this is in our entity, not in our model because we have to be sure that draft model is for data that has not been sent to server yet. So we just add this parameter in entity to do some query later. 
And then in our post function here, take a look on the last line. We also need to change a sync value to true after we successfully send the data to server to mark the data for future retrieval. So now our get function also need to change a bit to get data from DAO and draft DAO, but this time we just need unsync data from draft DAO. Something like this, so the combination right now is data from server and draft data that has not been synced to or sent to server before. By doing this, we are making sure that data will not appear duplicated. So now we're pretty sure that all data appear to user and not duplicate as well. And another key point from offline first step is we cannot just rely to server about when the user input data because they can just input the data and input again and stay offline like hours or days or in our case even weeks because they can just input from one farm and then move to another farm to make another input but we also want to know when they input the data. So we are adding registered at fields here with local date time type for keeping track of input time. It will automatically store time now to each data when the data stored to our local database. And this local date time is a local device time, not the time that they send to server. So for those who wants to make offline first app, in write strategy first is make sure after user input data, it will show in the screen and not duplicate with the sync one after it's successfully synced. And because it's an offline first app, we also need to make sure that we can get the proper time for input. But of course, this is, depends on your app requirements. So yeah, this is our right strategies in a picture. Let's say we start when user press submit. We save the draft to draft DAO with async value false, then draft DAO will push new data and publish it to subscribers and it will update the UI. And at the same time, we also call our work manager to post not sync data from DAO. We post it to API, and when it's success, we update the draft in draft DAO with is synced value true, and also save the response from API to DAO. After that, DAO and draft DAO will push new data and publish to subscriber and update, update the UI as well. So yeah, that's it. That's how we design our offline first app. So next, we are going to talk about what challenges we faced in the real situations and solutions that we came up with. So from now on, Takuya-san will take over. Thank you so much. So, uh, so far, uh, Arif has talked about the overall design. So, but for me, let me introduce some, some of the real case challenges we faced uh, while implementing indiv individual features and solutions. So first, images cannot be displayed offline. This is the farmer's detail screen where you can view the farmer's profile, including their photo and name. Farmer information like uh, name, birthday, etc., was fetched and cached after signing in, and it can be displayed offline. But images were not. Images were lazy loaded. So uh, this caused a problem when moving to an offline farm and trying to use the app as the images were not displayed, like the uh, screenshot. Former images, former images are required for identification of farmers. The, the photo and name must be verified. Once the identity is verified, agents can distribute uh, agricultural materials and register the recovery data and etc. from this screen. The farmer photo is very important information. Therefore, this problem had to be solved. To solve this issue, 
we prefetch and cache the required images in, in, in advance when online. Uh, the fetch request is queued when the app is launched and wait until the network is available. Once the app connects the network, the, the app starts to fetch images in the background. Then images can be loaded offline. If the fetch fails due to a timeout or loss of internet connection, the fetch will be performed again when it comes online. We use Work Manager to fetch images in the background when the device is online. Here's the code of uh, Worker to fetch photos. I don't explain Work Manager in detail, but do work function runs asynchronously on a background thread provided by Work Manager. So uh, inside do work function, we prefetch images. This is the code inside do work function. We use coil as an image loading library. To prefetch images and cache them, create a request and enqueue it to image loader without setting target. Target is where we receive the loaded images, uh, such as image view. In this case, we don't set target because we just get image, images from the server and store them. Uh, to prefetch images into only the disk cache, disable the memory cache by passing disabled to memory cache policy function. Because all images aren't displayed soon, we don't need to store them to the memory cache. And uh, enqueue the request to image loader. The requests for each farmer's photo are enqueued like this. Uh, one more thing, the cache size is set to a default value, which is small, so make sure you have the required capacity. You can set this cache, uh, you can set the, this cache with your own cache size configuration to image loader. In this code, the cache size is set to 50% of the device's disk space. With this configuration, enough cache size is kept for us. It might be too, too large for you, but uh, this is just an example. Configuration depends on the requirements of your app. Uh, this is a call to load and display the image. Async image is a composable function that executes an image request asynchronously and renders the result. If you set the same URL as the prefetched image URL, the image will be loaded from the cache. Then the image is successfully displayed, even offline, like the screenshot. The, the problem was that the necessary data was not obtained when online based on real use cases. Image data was missing as data required for offline use cases. The important thing is that uh, information required for offline, offline use must be identified in the light of the actual use cases. It's also important to remember to consider the, the data, such as images, in doing so. So next, uh, can get location offline. There's a feature that is called farm mapping. This feature uh, uses smartphone location to map farmland by walking around the boundary of the farmland. We do this to clarify the actual uh, farm boundary and the size for each farmers. To get location on Android device, it's recommended to use Fields Location Provider API, and we implemented using it. Fields Location Provider provides location data by 
combining GPS, Wi-Fi, uh, cellular network, and other sensors on the device. When we tested this implementation in farmland in Ghana, we encountered issues where the location was inaccurate or couldn't be retrieved at all. This photo is one of them. We can get location information, but they were unstable. Uh, some points were different from the actual position or sometimes uh, jump to different location. Many of the farmlands we do farm mapping are in areas where the network is very unstable or no Wi-Fi, no mobile network. As fuse location provider also uses information for the network, we assume that it might be difficult to determine location well in some cases in areas where the network is very unstable or no network. Android devices use not only GPS, but also a network, such as Wi-Fi and cellular network, as main sources to get location, uh, plus many other sensors on the device. This table is a simplified comparison of GPS and network provider. GPS provider uses satellites to, to know your location up to around 20 meters it's generally more accurate than network-based location data. However, there are some disadvantages, uh, such as increased battery consumption and uh, inability to get accurate location indoors and also outdoors around the tall buildings because GPS uh, signals may be blocked and it's hard to receive satellite signal there. On the other hand, network provider is less accurate than GPS, but it's available indoors. It depends on nearby Wi-Fi access point and cell towers. When the area has fewer Wi-Fi and cell towers, the, the accuracy is lower and the location is not available when not network. Another good point of network provider is that it drains less battery. Let's say we just focus on this part of the table. GPS has the advantage, even if the other parts of the table have weaknesses. We need high accuracy and offline use for farm mapping. For farm mapping feature, uh, that is used offline outdoors, we try to get location using only GPS because our user's environment is offline outdoors and farmland, no buildings. So uh, GPS is available in offline environment. We consider that GPS will be effective in many cases in this environment. As it's not possible to specify a uh, specific location provider like GPS with fuse location provider. We decided to use a node API location manager. The, the implementation doesn't differ much from using fuse location provider. Let's see the code before and after. Before, on the left, we used fuse location provider. It's from Google Play Services. At first, get Fuse location provider client from location services. On the other hand, the right side in the current code, get location manager from context. Uh, retrieve and record location data periodically while working around the farmland. Call request, request location updates to receive location updates at regular intervals. Method name is the same for both. To this method, as for uh, fuse location provider, left side, set the location request. You can specify desired update interval, the level of accuracy, power consumption, minimum update distance, etc. And similarly, for the location manager, 
So the request with intervals, minimum, minimum distance and quality, etc. And say so callback to do something like uh, storing data and updating UI. They are each used in a similar way. The difference is that you can't specify a uh, location provider for the left-hand side field location provider. You can set only priority, which gives location services a hint about which location, service, location sources to use. By specifying priority high accuracy, the location services are more likely to use GPS to determine the location other provid providers can be used as well. On the other hand, the right side with location manager, you can specify GPS as a location provider. This ensures that only GPS provider is used. We tested the implementation using GPS only with this code and confirmed that it was stable enough to map farmland with unstable network or offline. So we decided to use GPS, even if it has the aforementioned disadvantages. We didn't find this issue during the development of this feature. The lesson of this issue is that location data is highly sensitive to devices environment. So it can be difficult to detect problems in a developer's environment. It's therefore important to test in the user's VO environment on our stage. And uh, finally, as this is an optimization for the limited situation of offline farmland, so it may not be helpful in many cases. However, it was presented as an example of a case where there are more effective method than using fused fuse location provider, as location is highly de dependent on the user environment. And finally, can, can display polyline or map offline. Polyline is a series of connected line segments that can be used to mark paths and routes on the map. That consists of a list of points where line segments are drawn between consecutive points. For farm mapping, the user actually walks around the farmland and get location data. The location data is stored as a list, which is connected and drawn as a polyline to show the route walked on the map, like the screenshot. However, the polyline were not displayed in offline environments. If the area has never been shown on the map, the map image will not be displayed offline because map images are needed to be downloaded. Without any visual feedback during file mapping, like this photo, it's hard to trust that location data is accurate. accurate especially when uh, making turns or other movements, uh, which can cause anxiety about whether the measurements are accurate. With a point line displayed, at least they can see if the route they walked aligns with the farmland's outline. For this reason, we wanted to display only the point line, even if the map image couldn't be displayed. I don't think it's mentioned in official documentation, but we found that once the map is displayed online, we can display point lines offline. The effect will last until the app is uninstalled. Therefore, we decided to force map to be displayed immediately after signing in on first startup. We show a dialog like this. Uh, there's a map on the dialog. In the screenshot, the map is successfully loaded and show Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. Right after signing in, the user can, uh, 
the user can expect to be connected to the network, so there's a good chance that map can be displayed online. Until this is completed, we will attempt to display maps every time the app is launched and encourage users to launch the app online. This is a dialog. There is a uh, Google Map Composable on a lot dialog. Google Map Composable has uh, on map loaded callback. It's invoked when a map is finished loading. So we need to confirm on map loaded is code. Once this is code, polyline will appear on the map even if offline. Like this, even though the map image isn't shown, the gray background, polyline is shown offline. So uh, this issue was also not discovered during development. Once the app was debugged online, the issue would not occur. So the app had to be reinstalled and tested offline from the beginning. So in addition to regular checks, it's also uh, it's necessary to check offline functionality after reinstalling the app. Uh, that's it for me. Let me get back to Arif. Oh. Thank you, Takuya-san. Finally, Matomi this. So we've had share about our implementation and also our real case challenges for our app. So to summarize this, first in offline first app, we should consider to store draft and sync data separately. Second, we can also create an interface for draft and sync data source, so it will make it easy for us when retrieving it. And also what we can learn from challenges that we've had is, first we have to prioritize the data to fetch beforehand because they only online for a period of time. And second, if we need to implement some library. It's good to follow recommendation from its documentation, but sometimes it won't work on our case, so it's okay to be a little bit creative for that. And the last but not least, we need to testing in the real environment because our workplace is not the same with our user condition. So sometimes we found some unexpected things that our user experience. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for you guys' attention for these past 40 minutes. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach us. We'd be very happy to discuss with you guys. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.